adding these dishes to our menu. And we've also got a wide range of Lebanese groceries. We like Brunswick because it's very multicultural. Me and my siblings have been here a majority of our lives. This is our second home and we like to treat our customers as our own family. We're very proud in what we do and how we do it. G'day guys, my name's Chris. Hi. I'm here from Moreland City Council just to show you a bit about this tractor and how it works and what we do and how we uh, get around and cut all the grass on the ovals. How's that? Is that better? <laughs> you want to play tag with the tractor? Your teachers will find it. Thank you very much. Bye, goodbye. Bye. In 2009, Council began research and consultation to identify the key challenges in sport for women and girls within Moreland. The review identified several issues. There was a serious lack of female competition and teams. Only 8% of participants using Council sports grounds were female. To address this inequality, Council introduced a policy to encourage clubs to be more inclusive of women, juniors, people with a disability and people from culturally diverse communities or risk losing an allocation of a ground to a club that is being inclusive. Female participation has now increased by 161% in Moreland. West Coburg Football Club is proud to align with Moreland's policy. This year we successfully launched the club's first ever under 12 girls footy team. We're changing our club. We're changing our culture. I'm changing the game. Hello everyone, I'm Councillor John Kavanagh, the Mayor of Moreland. It's fantastic to visit Oak Park and see how the works are tracking. All pool structures are complete. The roofing is now underway for the sports pavilion. The next phase includes testing the pool structures and the construction of the water slide. Watch this space for more updates. I'm Moana Hope, most people call me Mo. I've grown up playing at Glenway Football Club and now I play for Collingwood Football Club. I grew up in Glenroy, born and bred. My first year ever I played at Hatfield. From the second year all the way up to year under 12, it's Glenroy Football Club. Uh, I'm one of 14 um, and the reason why I got into it was my dad and my brothers. I used to watch all their games from the age of three. It was community football, so it was the best time of football. So proud. Local footy is really important, I think, you know, especially uh, Glen Marie being the suburb and this being uh, the main supplier of sports for the community. You look at what Glen Marie trying to do here, trying to bring up a women's team and, and in the background is my niece who just finished under 12. So at the moment she hasn't got a pathway. So Melanie's played for Glen Marie from the same age as me, from the age of seven. And she is now too old to play boys football. So she's excited about the girls team, aren't you? Very. So she's extremely competitive, not as good as me. Calm down. Probably a few kids are are not on the right road and I think if you give them that, that sport or that outlet to go and, and meet new people it can benefit the community in more ways than one. What do I say to girls? It doesn't matter who you are, what your skill level you are, what fitness level you are. It's a good environment to be in, it's fun, you meet new mates. This is where you want to be so come down and have a kick. So I'm Claire Johnston and I'm an accredited cricket bat maker and the first female in the world. I um, learnt how to make cricket bats from Ian Cullen. There's a lot of bats out there for men and I felt that there was an opportunity there to actually work with women to make better bats and to actually make them for their style. So recently I was commissioned to make five cricket bats for the Pascoe Vale Headfield uh, Cricket Club for their under 13s girls cricket team. And uh, yeah, to see their faces when they were given the cricket bats was just brilliant. So what I'd really love to be able to do is to keep working with my local community, the local cricket clubs, um, particularly the women, and uh, yeah, work to make great cricket bats. My name is Michael Tortoni. I'm the founder of Melbourne's legendary jazz club, Bennett's Lane. 
I've recently moved to the very, very cool Brunswick. The Jazz Lab here on Leslie Street, Brunswick is Melbourne's new home of jazz. In my old club, you might have seen Prince for a late night set, or the Winton Marsalis Band, or even the Harry Connick Jr. Trio. My new... Good evening, councillors, members of the gallery, and to our viewers live streaming tonight's meeting. <coughs> my name is Councillor Arlery Family, and I'm the interim chairperson of the Urban Planning Committee, while Councillor Dale Martin is on a leave of absence. It is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's meeting. Our meeting is being held on the traditional country of the Wurundjeri people, and I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners. I would also like to pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and the elders from other communities who may be here today. I acknowledge that currently many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have made Moreland home. In doing so, have contributed to the positive, rich diversity of this municipality. Members of the gallery, please note this Urban Planning Committee is meeting is being recorded and web streamed live to Council's website and Facebook. This recording will also be available as video on demand. Gallery attendees are advised they will be recorded during the meeting. Councillors, just as a reminder that in line with the adopted Council of Conduct principles, as outlined in the Council of Code of Conduct, councillors should ensure they conduct themselves in the meeting with integrity, impartiality, exercise their responsibility in the interest of the local community and not improperly seek to confer or advantage any person. <coughs> this behaviour will support principles for, for leadership and good at governance that secures public confidence in the Office of Councillor. I'd like to begin by introducing the councillors and officers in attendance. <coughs> The councillors in attendance tonight are Deputy Mayor Councillor Natalie Boot, mm -hmm. Councillor Anna Olivia Carly Hannon, yes. Councillor Helen Davidson, Hello. our Mayor John Kavanagh, Good evening. Councillor Jess Dorney, Hi. Councillor Mark Riley, just in time, <laughs> Councillor Lambros Tapanos, <laughs> and Councillor Sue Bolton. Hi. The officers in attendance tonight are Group Manager City Development Philip Priest. Urban manager, uh, unit manager of urban planning, Narelle Jennings. Planning coordinator, Darren Caramelleri. Planning coordinator, Mark Hughes. Principal urban planner, Andy Wilson. Unit manager of governance, Sally Curran. And governance officer, Saskia Hunter. Councillors, do we have any apologies tonight? Uh, he's on an approved leave of absence, that's okay. Uh, we'll move on to the adoption of the minutes. Can I please have a motion for the adoption of the minutes for the meeting held on the 28th of February 2018? So moved. Councillor Kavanagh has moved those minutes. Is there a seconder? Councillor Davidson? All those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried. Councillors, are there any? Is there a declaration of interest and or conflict of interest for tonight? No? We'll move on to the community reports. Before we start, I will give members of the gallery and those watching the live stream an outline of how the Urban Planning Committee will run this evening. Firstly, a planner will introduce the report and officers' recommendations. Secondly, I will then give any objectors the opportunity to move to the lectern and to make their submission. And thirdly, after this time, the applicant will be given the opportunity to speak. If you are making a submission, please clearly state your name and address for the record. You are requested to present viewpoints clearly and concisely on why you support or oppose the planning application. Please do not repeat what earlier speakers have said and keep the discussion focused on relevant issues and points not previously raised. If you are opposed to the planning application, would you please inform the committee why you are opposed and suggest an alternative approach which would satisfy your concerns. Please use this opportunity to focus on your concerns rather than matters of detail in the officer's report. Please note that there is a limit of three minutes for each speaker. As chairperson, I reserve the right to increase or reduce the time available to any speaker. We'll move on to the presentation of the reports. And the first report we have this evening is DED 1318, 199 to 201 O'Hay Street, Coburg. I'll move to the officers to present the report. Thank you, Councillor. Um, my name's Mark Hughes, I'm one of the planning coordinators of the City of Moreland. I'm presenting the planning application at land known as 199 and 201 O'Hay Street in Coburg. Approval is sought for the construction of five double storey dwellings, two of which are four bed and three of which are two bed. There's one dwelling in a reversed living arrangement, 
seven car spaces are proposed on site and permission is sought to reduce the visitor car space. On the screen gives an indication of the, um, the site of surrounds. The surrounding area is mostly residential. Um, some of the notable exceptions will be the Coburg North Primary School and adjoining the O'Hay Street Bakery and Deli. Just uh, another aerial image on the screen. These are the um, ground floor plans and landscape plans which show the um, general arrangement of the dwelling. So they're in two rows. There's a central driveway and one vehicle crossing. This is the first floor which um, shows bedrooms at the upper level with the exception of um, the middle dwelling or unit four which is, as I said, the reverse living arrangement. And that's the proposal presented in, in elevation. The assessment um, considered Clauses 55, clauses 2201, which is our neighbourhood character policy, clause 5206, which are the car parking requirements, and clause 228, which is council's ESD policy. I should also say, um, following public notice, a total of 12 objections were received. The main issues raised in the objections related to neighbourhood character, car parking, and congestion from additional vehicles or additional traffic. Um, the clause 55 or rest code assessment revealed there were some variations to the building envelope described in standards B17 and B18. Those variations were deemed acceptable due to the abutting in commercial building or the, uh, the bakery. Um, there is also a variation to the solar access standard. Um, those variations have been dealt with through conditions known as condition 1G and 1H. Um, the recommendation begins on page three of tonight's agenda and recommends that a notice of decision to grant a planning permit be issued subject to a number of conditions. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Are there any objectors or submitters who wish to speak on this item? Yes, please come forward. Could you please state your name and address for the record? Nick Dolby, Hope of Crescent West Brunswick. This is on O'Hay Street. It's adjacent to the O'Hay Street bicycle path, uh, an important and uh, useful piece of uh, bicycle infrastructure. The planning team has attempted to address issues of bikes on this. It does have one crossover where well, there was once two crossovers uh, across the path. They have uh, bicycle parking has been provided at the uh, flats. Um, such bicycle parking will not only perhaps promote the use of bicycles, but certainly remind the occupants that there are cyclists going back and forth outside their house. However, I want to raise two issues. One is that the bicycle parking is window dressing. Um, its positioning is basically, if you want to take your bike for a ride, you're going to have to wheel it through your house. Um, so if you want to use your bike, hop on it, go for a quick ride to the shops and so on, no, you've got to open all the doors in the house where you bike through and so on. It should be more central. It should be actually functionally useful, like the car parking. It opens directly onto the street. Secondly, I'm worried about sight lines. The sight lines for the footpath and bike path as vehicles are leaving the property. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you, Nick. Uh, are there any other objectives or submissions you wish to speak? No? Uh, does the applicant or representative of the applicant wish to speak? Please come forward. Uh, good evening, uh, Councillor Flan. Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> and fellow councillors. Good evening. Um, and just your name and address of the record. Yeah, the name Daniel Herman. Um, I'm here on behalf of the permit applicant working for Town Parks. Okay. Um, so, just like to firstly thank you for the opportunity to, to present to you. Um, you may or may not be aware, it's certainly detailed in the officer report about the VCAT permit history of the site. Um, 2014, there was an application for a three story apartment building on a collective site that included the bakery as well as land at 207 O'Hay Street. Um, the same landowner was obviously involved in that. We've sat down since that decision, which was refused by VCAT. Um, looked carefully at it, which was, was, was refused based on the typology, not fitting in with the surrounding context. 
And the current design that you have before you is, is really a response to that. Um, we certainly sought to reduce the scale, the density of the development, to a point where we believe has, it fits very well with the neighbourhood character. And we've certainly worked really closely with the council officers on this um, in terms of trying to please them with a number of design changes throughout the process. Um, overall, we, we certainly support the officer recommendation. It's for, for a notice of decision. So we commend that. Um, and we certainly believe that it's going to make a valuable contribution to the local area. Um, in terms of the objection we heard just in relation to bike parking, um, it is worth noting that storage sheds could be provided on the site without a permit requirement. Um, and they could certainly house a bicycle on there quite easily if, if the future owners would like that. Um, in addition to that, the bike parking requirements of the planning scheme are not, not actually triggered under this development. And that's under clause 5234. Um, the only query we've got is, at the moment is in relation to condition 1G. And that's in relation to the requirements of standard B29. And essentially the way the, the condition is worded, it's, it's quite general at the moment. It may seem pretty innocuous, but it does require some... Because of the, the flood level requirements for the site, it does require quite a lot of floor area removal at the back of those, those rear two dwellings. Um, we believe the current private open space and the setback it's provided at the rear, it's 3.9 metres in width, provides a really good quality open space area for dwelling two and three. Um, Daniel, you've got 20 seconds to go, I'll yep. just get you to start winding up. So I just want to say, we kindly request you to review that condition closely as part of your decision. Um, whilst it doesn't meet the standard, we believe it certainly has merit in the way it's proposed at the moment. And really appreciate the time and, and the officer recommendation. Thank you. Now, before you take a seat, Daniel, I'll just ask the councillors if they have any questions for you, for Daniel. Thank you. You can take a seat. Thank you. Do any councillors have any questions to put to the officers? Just confirm, are there any questions for officers? No. Council, if there are no questions, could I please have a motion? Could I move the officer recommendation on pages three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine? And if I have a seconder, I'll speak to it. Is there a seconder for Councillor Cameron? Councillor Davidson? Um, would you like to speak to the motion, yeah, Councillor Cameron? Yeah. Um, obviously, I'm moving the motion, so it means that I'm supportive of the officer recommendation. It shouldn't be viewed as being uh, thrilled about the uh, uh, officer recommendation because I'm, I'm really not. In essence, I'm moving the motion because of a number of factors. Number one, it's in a general residential zone. It's not in a neighbourhood residential zone. Therefore, I believe there can be a little bit more intensity. I'm a little bit concerned about unit four and particularly the fact that it's a, a reverse cycle, uh, it's a reverse mm -hmm. living, sorry, not reverse cycle, reverse living operation. I'm not very, a big fan of reverse living, uh, but I suppose in the fact that there's only one out of the five is acceptable to me, and the fact that it is on the western side, so therefore uh, abuts the commercial operation rather than the residential on the east, puts it in favour. Um, for those two reasons, uh, and the fact that of the previous history on the site, this is certainly a far better outcome than what was originally proposed in the uh, original uh, application in 2014. Um, you know, if I was having, uh, if I could um, justify it, I'd like number four unit to be removed and it was a four unit development, but I do think that considering it's in a general residential zone, it has a commercial property to the western side, um, I do believe that um, it'd probably be uh, supported at uh, an appeal. Uh, and so therefore, for those reasons and the fact that in almost all other areas it is compliant to Res Code, then I'm supportive of its uh, acceptance. Thank you, Councillor Kavanagh. Councillor Davidson, would you like to speak as a seconder? Yeah, I'll just briefly say that I'm happy with um, the result from this development, the way you've worked with officers as well. I think that it's got a good level of compliance. Um, it's sensitive to the adjoining properties, the commercial side and the residential side. Um, 
it isn't something that I can particularly fault, um, so I'm supportive of it. Thank you, Councillor Davison. Are there any councillors that wish to speak against uh, the motion? Are there any other speakers in favour of the motion? Councillors, um, I will, given there's no further debate, I will move to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried. I'll return to the planning officer to outline the next steps. Thank you. The Urban Planning Committee is resolved to issue a notice of decision to grant a planning permit. Um, following this meeting, that decision will be posted to all objectors and the applicant. The objectors have a 21-day period to lodge any reviews at the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal. If no appeals are lodged, the planning permit will then issue. Thank you. Thank you. The next report we have this evening is DED 1418, 29 Sydney Road, Brunswick. I will move to the council officers to present the report. Thank you, my name is Darren Camilleri, Planning Coordinator at Lawn City Council. And I'm here to present the matter of 29 Sydney Road in Brunswick, which encompasses the Sarah Sands uh, Hotel. Um, what we're hearing today is a position of a mediated um, proposal for an eight-storey building and the retention of the Sarah Sands Hotel. Uh, this application was heard at the December Urban Planning Committee meeting where it was determined that the application be, um, its position would be one of not to support the application at um, the Victorian Civil <coughs> Administrative Tribunal. Since that time, amended plans have been uh, circulated, which um, are an attempt to mediate um, with objective parties and council uh, in relation to the um, proposal, and that's for an eight-storey building in lieu of a ten-storey building and the retention of the Sarah Sands Hotel. There were plans that were circulated on the 6th of March, which formed the basis of the assessment of the report that was circulated. However, on the 22nd of March, um, a revised set of plans, amended plans were circulated, um, and they are matters of detail that were further elaborated on the 6th of, of March plans. I will go through the differences later in the report. So that's a subject site, as we know it. That's the view of the corner of Sydney Road and Brunswick Road. It's in the commercial one zone with a design and development overlay. Uh, key is that it's a 19 metre preferred height of six storeys and there's a heritage overlay that affects the site along with a parking overlay. So on the top left hand side is the demolition plan of the proposal as was uh, refused at the December Urban Planning Committee meeting which showed that the entire site was proposed to be demolished except for the skin um, of the exi existing building. Um, the key difference with the without prejudice proposal before us today is that um, the Sarah Sands Hotel will be retained in its entirety. I'll now go through a series of uh, massing 3D diagrams that shows the difference between the without prejudice plans and the refused 10-storey proposal. That's the view, as you can see it, from the corner of Sydney Road and Brunswick Road. That's on the western approach on Brunswick Road. You can see the reduction in, in height of the proposal. Um, you will notice that the uh, Black Street Brunswick Road corner has shown on the left hand side an increase in height of one storey in the without prejudice plans compared to the refused plans. That's a view from the Black Street and that's an aerial of the without prejudice plans. Another view from Brunswick Road. and now the floor plans which show uh, the layout generally staying the same as those that were the plans that were considered in, in the December Urban Planning Committee meeting with access off the laneway to the, to the rear for the cars. Um, a 
licensed premises on the corner of Brunswick Road and Sydney Road. As we go up, that's level one, the apartments and the hotel. As we further go up, there's apartments on the podium level. Um, retention of the existing heritage hotel roof. And this is just a comparison that shows the refused tower, which extended much closer to the Sydney Road frontage compared to the current um, without prejudice plans, which show the uh, apartment tower contained within the um, western portion of the site. Just a brief history, it was advertised in August 2017, received 37 objections, with the key object issues being the height, demolition, off-site and many impacts from building traffic and the liquor licence. There was a VCAT appeal that was lodged for failure to determine within 60 days, and I've said the other planning committee resolved to refuse that application. Um, and there's a VCAT compulsory conference on the 4th of April, which is next week, where the applicant, council and objectors who lodge statement of grounds will be in attendance. And if needed, there'll be a merits hearing on the 14th of May 2018 if um, consent is not reached at the compulsory conference. As I mentioned earlier, um, on late on Thursday last week, uh, 20 plans dated the 22nd of March were circulated to all parties that differ slightly from the plans that um, the report is based on, which are the 6th of March plans. And up on the screen is a summary of some of the key changes um, between the two sets of plans. I'd, I'd note that the, the massing of the proposal really hasn't changed at all. And what we've got on the table there are more matters of detail um, and minor um, points of differentiation, um, some of which can be um, addressed through conditions of, if there is a position to agree with this proposal at the Pulse Conference, can be um, worked out through conditions of that approval if that is the position that's taken. But just quickly, um, the height stays the same in terms of the 6th of March plans are eight storeys, so reduction of two storeys, there's no change there. The number of apartments has been reduced by four, and there's an increase in the dwelling diversity because we've now got um, four three-bedroom uh, dwellings in the latest set of plans. The number of car spaces has been reduced uh, commensurate to the reduction in, car in apartments. Um, and as the hotel is, is probably the biggest change where there's now a, a, a deck on top of the hotel uh, that will be licensed. <clears throat> and the comment there is that the floor area and the size and location is similar to the application plans which were considered acceptable at the December UPC meeting. And all the last few are just related to the to massing and there's, there's no change to those. So the amended recommendation is simply changing a reference to uh, the 22nd of March plans rather than the 6th of March plans which is contained in the, in the, the report that was circulated. But the position is that the without prejudice plans um, be supported um, subject to a number of conditions and the key reason is being that there's been a significant improvement in relation to a height reduction to eight storeys and the retention of the Sarah Sands Hotel. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. <coughs> Councillor, we've got a yeah. question for that one. Um, officer, I just have a question regarding the changes to the plans. With the roof deck now, um, hotel deck, um, I know the um, Sarah Sands or Radio Rollies is heritage listed. Is the roof part of the heritage listing? And by having a deck, does that compromise that? I'll just put up the plans just to yeah. help that discussion. Um, so the the heritage overlay is over the whole that whole site. So under the um, 6th of March plans, that didn't show a roof deck. No, and now, right. now obviously there is. So one of the considerations will be the extent of that deck and, deck and what um, what level of um, how far it should go, and that could be resolved through conditions of. Uh, any consent that's reached between the parties and the, at the compulsory conference next week. So there hasn't been enough time from when that was uh, circulated on the 22nd of March to work out that exact detail. So, um, for example, when we would get seek our advice from a heritage advisor before going to the compulsory conference. 
um, and that could change the uh, extent of that debt through conditions. Um, I, I did allow yeah, Councillor Cameron to ask a question. What I'll do last, the councillors to hold their questions for the officers yeah, at the end sorry, of the. Um, I just want to make that after the uh, uh, objectives and applicants sure. is able to speak. <clears throat> Are there any objectives you wish to speak to this item? Yes, please come forward. Thank you. Oh, just to the lectern here. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, just for the record, if you don't mind stating your name and address. Yes, my name's Elizabeth Jackson. I live at 347 Brunswick Road. Um, I'm here as a local resident and also as a representative of the Royal Historical Society of Victoria, which put in an objection to the original plans. Um, I'd like to congratulate the uh, planning department and the developers who've obviously worked very hard um, to come up with this revised plans, which actually addresses um, most of our concerns um, based on heritage considerations. As we know, this is an iconic Brunswick site. It's been a hotel since 1845. Uh, we really wanted to keep it, the original building, and this um, really achieves that. We've got some concern about the roof deck, which has been um, flagged already, but that, I think, can be discussed at the compulsory conference. Um, I'd also prefer to have six storeys rather than eight, but it, it may be that we have to compromise on that as well. But the main thing is that they're um, preserving the original hotel, keeping it as a hotel, um, restoring the inside, um, and so it's, it'll be a good outcome, we feel. Thank you. Thank you, Lizzie. Are there any other objectives we should speak? Yes. Uh, good evening, councillors. Uh, my name is Peter Atkins. Uh, I'm from Black Street. Uh, myself and my family live uh, 40 metres from the proposed site. Uh, I addressed the committee in December, voicing our concerns regarding the proposal. Uh, I'm just trying to clarify, it just seems uh, really confusing what's being proposed tonight because uh, from the first thing, first we heard was last week regarding the agenda that was going to be posted on Friday. Uh, the residents have been completely left out of the loop, as usual, with the council and the developers as far as the amendments that have been proposed tonight. Uh, we spoke to Andy Wilson, who's the principal urban planner who has uh, written the report, and he said to me and my neighbour who climbed later that the rooftop deck was no longer going to be included. And he said in the proposal, page 45, no internal alteration to the hotel or works to the roof are proposed. Page 55, response to objectors' concerns. <coughs> the amended plans remove the rooftop bar. Uh, and then in the plan, the actual plan on the agenda has no rooftop bar. So we're here tonight with a rooftop bar. Where, where has that come from? Uh, we've had no time to prepare anything. Plans went online on Friday. It's absurd that we've been left out of the um, conversation. Uh, it's like it's been snuck in at the last minute to uh, kind of confuse everybody. Uh, so that was just one point. Um, but actually, no, continuing on, on from that, uh, in the report, there's absolutely no reference to the uh, impact on the amenity to local residents regarding this, um, this alteration to the actual pub itself. From what I can see, it's actually grown in size from 1,089 square metres to now almost 1,200 square metres. Now, the entire reason for our uh, objection in the beginning was this operated as a beer barn for 20 years under Bright Air Rallies, completely impacted on the local amenity in a very negative way. So what do we have now? We have, instead of 1,000 square metres, we've got almost 1,200 square metres, a potential for the beer barn. They're nominated as uh, bar, wine bar, pub, tavern, wine store, just all over this kind of three-level giant uh, proposal. So that's really <coughs> concerning to us. It's this rooftop deck thing, it's just ridiculous. It's almost like the developer has, is, has got his cake and they're eating it too. They're increasing the size of the pub and they're putting an eight-storey development on top of it as well. It's just insane. Peter, we've just hit three minutes. I'll just ask you to start winding up if we can. Yeah, uh, just 
I just wanted to uh, finish. This was the original sales document for the pub three years ago. It's just really interesting. It says um, development opportunity. This is what the developer had when they bought the pub. And it just says, just put quickly, the site has been earmarked by Moreland City Council as having the potential for a five-storey development within the Brunswick structure plan. So now we've gone from 10 storeys to eight. It's just unacceptable. It doesn't fit in to the uh, heritage overlay in any way. It's single storey and two storey buildings that surround it. It's out of context and a joke. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And uh, just in response to your the first part of your question, <coughs> uh, the roof deck bar, um, I believe the council officers had the plans that were in the agenda which didn't have that roof deck bar. And, and as um, the officer has just advised, some late plans did come through, which unfortunately meant the uh, existing agenda couldn't be updated in time but he's taking the opportunity to update the residents uh, in the room, but I'm sure councillors will have some questions on that uh, in a moment, given that it wasn't in the agenda as well. Um, are there any other objectives who wish to speak to the item? Yes, please come forward. Good evening, councillors. Uh, my name's David Falacchio. And just for a bit of context, I've purchased one of the apartments in the development behind, which is currently under construction. I guess, I guess the main point um, from my perspective is the height. I was, I was bitterly disappointed when I read this uh, report put together by the planner. Um, and it references several times in here where the developer has started at 10 storeys and reduced it to eight. And that seems to be a fantastic outcome. I might be green on these issues, but I don't really understand the concept of having a guideline on height restrictions if you're not going to adhere to it. And we're talking about an additional 8.2 metres. So I was really bitterly disappointed to see that we've reduced it by two. And again, that's, that's been seen as a fantastic outcome. I still see that as 8.2 metres too high. Um, and to echo Peter's sentiments as well, I have concerns about um, this pub and liquor licence. Um, many locals who I've spoken to, um, people such as Peter, have, have gone on and on about the culture that existed around the pub with its 3am liquor licence and the issues, um, whether it be public urination, violence, drunken disorderly behaviour and what have you, congregating around the pub. We've now got an opportunity to set the record straight um, for future residents. These sorts of decisions are having 10 to 20 year impacts. And I don't think that that's been given proper consideration. So those are my two. Thank you, David. <clears throat> are there any other objectives you wish to speak to this item? Uh, does the applicant or representative of the applicant wish to speak? Yes, sir. Please come forward. Good evening, councillors. My name is Amanda Ring, and I'm a director of SJB Planning, who's been assisting the permit applicant with the proposal and has been working with them um, over the last uh, couple of months to amend the plans. Um, in response to all of the hard work that your officers have been doing on your behalf. Um, the plans in your agenda um, were effectively um, a, an early version of work that's been in progress at the site. And the story that those plans have been meaning to tell you is that the height of the building has come down, that the tower component, if you like, at the western edge of the site is now much narrower and slimmer and further set back from... Sydney Road. The Sarah Sands Hotel is completely left alone now in terms of there's no encroachment of residential apartments over it. So it's basically a two level hotel uh, with a, a rooftop bar and deck. But significantly, in our view, um, there, there will continue to be restoration of the hotel facade. And the original oldest part of the Sarah Sands roof is not going to be affected by the proposal. And I understand that that's entirely consistent with your heritage officer's recommendations and aspirations for the site. 
So the dwellings have come down and even in the work that's been done since, so progressing the plans that you have in your agenda to the plans that were circulated more recently in readiness for the compulsory conference on Wednesday, there's been a further reduction effectively in unit numbers, there's been refinement um, in accordance with the items set out in your agenda in part A of the officer's report, items nine, one through nine. So what we've been trying to do in these last few weeks, and um, hopefully um, you won't criticise us for us, but we've been trying to get those plans in line with officer aspirations uh, for the project. The applicant has been working hard on the plans, obviously, and is interested in trying to reach some form of agreement with the council and the objectors. And of course, we're hopeful that that could be achieved next week. It's a proposal which has been designed by one of Melbourne's premier architects. And the plan is to rejuvenate, to rejuvenate a prominent southern entry to your municipality and to give the heritage buildings at the site new life, a new economic life that'll take them into the future put more of your residents in proximity to public transport and good community services and facilities, and make a contribution to underpinning local businesses um, in the activity centre. One of your three um, uh, corridors within your uh, Sydney Road activity centre. Tonight, we'd like you to give um, us the chance um, to head to the compulsory conference on Wednesday with these plans as a basis for your officers to contribute constructively to the um, compulsory conference process. Um, we think it's a good outcome. Um, our client is interested in improving the hotel. It's in his interest, not, not just in your interest or Mr Atkins' interest, it's in his interest that that pub, that pub effectively lift its game and become a more contemporary um, pub opportunity um, with broader appeal and less social issues emanating from it. Amanda, you've just so, gone over your three minutes, so it's been okay. I'll sure. just get you to start right winding up. Yeah. So that's all I'd really like to say. I think it's worthy of your consideration. It's a good starting point for the council um, and the permanent applicant next week. And hopefully um, the, the discussion can continue on Wednesday and we all end up with a project that we can live with and can contribute positively to your municipality in this particular part of it. Now, before we take a seat, Amanda, sure. councillors may have questions for you. I'll, I will go to Councillor Bolton first. Um, two questions. Um, one, uh, did you notify any of the resident objectors to VCAT about the change of plans and what they were? The answer to that is yes. Yes. Like all of them? Uh, we, we notified all of, um, in terms of the notification, that is instructed by VCAT or determined by VCAT. And all of the parties who were originally notified of the application were notified that plans, um, oh, sorry, no, correct. Uh, we have provided advanced copies of the plans to the parties to the appeal. The objectors to the original application haven't been notified yet, uh, they would only be notified in the event that there is a formal substitution of the plans if the compulsory conference were to fail. And there may not be a substitution of the plans after the compulsory conference if agreement can't be reached. The permit applicant may well head forward with their 10-storey proposal. Okay, because we've certainly heard from someone tonight who hadn't been notified. Um, my second well, question, I think, sorry, if yeah. I'd just like to say that Mr Atkins has been provided with a copy of the um, most recent set of plans. So effectively yes. the set of plans. I've got, I've got the original plans on the first I'll, one. I'll, the agenda was put on on Friday. Thank you. I'll, I'll just get the comments to be directed to the chair. So uh, thank you for that. I'll just get the comments to be directed to the chair. Not the opportunity to sort of back sorry. and forth with sorry. Uh, Residents, but I'll get Councillor Bolton asked. And just the one last, last question: At which stage did the rooftop garden get um, deck. put in? Rooftop deck get put into the plans. Mm -hmm. So the the rooftop deck has effectively been restored to the plans. So the rooftop deck was a component of the ten storey scheme, mm -hmm. and it has been restored to the project following what is in your agenda as the March plans. So. Um, you might want to form a view about that tonight. 
um, but that's, it, it has been restored to the scheme uh, subsequent to the March plans. Thanks. Councillor Kavanagh. Yes, now I've got a couple too. Um, can I ask when you were started your engagement with the applicant? Um, so SJB planning was engaged um, by the permit applicant um, sort of earlier uh, last year, early towards mid last year. So you you were responsible for the original plans that came before the, the Urban Planning Committee? Well, when you say responsible, the architect is responsible and the permit applicant has a vision for what they would like to do the site as, ex as expressed by the architect. I have another couple more. Um, when were you notified of the, um, of the uh, VCAT hearing on the 4th of April? What sort of a notification do you get of that uh, hearing? Uh, we get this, exactly the same notification that you get. I can check that date, but yeah. we get the same correspondence that you get posted on the same day and hopefully arriving at a similar time. Okay, well, I'll just check. When, when did we find out about the VCAT here? And can I ask? And I want to come back to you, if that's all right. So there's a question for the officer? Yeah. yeah. Um, so my understanding is, I don't have the details right in front of me, but my understanding is that in February, VCAT gave orders for a compulsory conference. Um, and there may have been a request to delay the compulsory conference to the 4th of April, if my memory serves me correctly. Okay. Right. So, uh, close. my final question is, so you're involved in the beginning of the middle of last year. Um, you heard about the VCAT hearing in the start of February. Why did it take to the 22nd of Mar uh, March to submit the final plans that you wanted the decision to be made tonight about where we were going forward? For me, that's too late. Mm. Um, well, there, there's, a, there's a reasonably simple answer to that, Councillor Kavanagh, yep. and that is that there's a lot of intellectual thinking that needs to go into the preparation of the plans. And ultimately, we wanted to go to the compulsory conference next week with something that wasn't sort of half-baked. We wanted to go with something that um, you could rely on, um, that we could rely on, and that the objectors or the, the parties to the appeal could rely on. Um, and we wanted to do that rather than... Um, yes, we okay. wanted to do that. Can I, I, I did say a final everybody. question, but I'm going to ask one more. Do you think that the the uh, wishes of the uh, the concerns of objectors, etc., fail in comparison to the intellectual thinking that goes into it. I'm disappointed that they haven't had a genuine opportunity to be involved in this process with the plans that were originally su um, submitted on the uh, on March 6. It was March 6. I can understand it, but March 22nd, decision is being made tonight. I think it's the 28th, and we're talking about the 4th of April. I understand the intellectual. Uh, stimulation, etc. But I'm more concerned about residents not having an opportunity. Well, um, I, I hear that concern, um, and it's always a balance for people like me who are trying to get you good quality material that you can rely on, and also get the same good quality material to the the objectors. I think the important thing to say, perhaps, about the compulsory conference next week is that if the if the uh, if ultimately the objectors don't like what is before them, then the matter may not settle at the compulsory conference and everybody will have to, sadly, perhaps, bat on to appeal on the 14th of May for four days. So, um, again, it was with the very best of intentions that the material has been circulated recently to inform everybody of a, of a well-reasoned proposition. Thank, thank you. I've got Councillor Riley with a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, thank you. Look, um, I, I find that interesting because... Um, the proponents were the people that went to VCAT based on the fact that we hadn't processed your application on time, but in that intervening time, you've actually put up two more sets of plans. So the, the veracity of the original application and your preparedness for that, and the sort of the blame's been put on us for not having met our timelines, but you've actually come up with two more sets of plans and you've actually excluded the community from the consultation. I find that quite difficult. The other issue that has been very important around this site is the office uh, the hours of operation for the pub and I know and I just want to be clarified as to what can be done about those hours and if an office can address that or whether you can address that because the the community have already talked about that this evening around the behaviors and we're dealing with that in other areas of Sydney Road and you're talking about contributing to the community I'm wondering how these hours and the liquor licensing aspects are going to contribute to that community I understand their existing rights, but I just would like it clarified for the community as to 
whether we can influence those hours and if so, how we can do that. I don't know whether you want me to try and answer that question, Councillor Riley, or whether you'd prefer... I'm interested offices. in the proponent's right. okay. view on it. So, so um, obviously, the, as you uh, rightly observed, the hotel has existing use rights for both patron numbers and for hours of operation. Uh, we haven't uh, proposed nor have we offered a reduction in those hours. That's, that's the licence at the moment. And the council, I understand, has no um, lawful capacity to reduce our hours. But certainly that's something that could be put on the table, potentially, at the compulsory conference. Who knows how the permit applicant might respond in that environment? Are there any other questions for the applicant? Thanks, Mary. You can take a seat. Can I just, if I could just uh, say... Sorry, that. you've had your opportunity, so thank you. Uh, are there any questions for the, the officers from councillors? No? Um, there's been a number of uh, new updates coming through that wasn't on the uh, agenda tonight. Um, so what I'm going to do is allow councillors an extra five minutes to consider uh, how they will uh, approach this one. I'm going to call an adjournment for five minutes and we'll be back at uh, 20 past five. <coughs> G'day guys, my name's Chris. Hi. I'm here from Moreland City Council just to show you a bit about this tractor and how it works and what we do and how we uh, get around and cut all the grass on the ovals. How's that? Is that better? <laughs> <laughs> you want to play tag with the tractor? Your teachers will find it. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. In 2009, Council began research and consultation to identify the key challenges in sport for women and girls within Moreland. The review identified several issues. There was a serious lack of female competition and teams. Only 8% of participants using Council sports grounds were female. To address this inequality, Council introduced a policy to encourage clubs to be more inclusive of women, juniors, people with a disability and people from culturally diverse communities or risk losing an allocation of a ground to a club that is being inclusive. Female participation has now increased by 161% in Moreland. West Coburg Football Club is proud to align with Moreland's policy. This year we successfully launched the club's first ever under 12 girls footy team. We're changing our club. We're changing our culture. I'm changing the game. Hello everyone, I'm Councillor John Kavanagh, the Mayor of Moreland. It's fantastic to visit Oak Park and see how the works are tracking. All pool structures are complete. The roofing is now underway for the sports pavilion. The next phase includes testing the pool structures and the construction of the water slide. Watch this space for more updates. I'm Moana Hope, most people call me Mo. I've grown up playing at Glenway Football Club and now I play for Collingwood Football Club. What did you do to I grew up in Glenroy, born and bred. My first year ever I played at Hatfield. From the second year all the way up to year under 12, it's Glenroy Football Club. Uh, I'm one of 14 um, and the reason why I got into it was my dad and my brothers. I used to watch all their games from the age of three. It was community football, so it was the best type of football. So proud of you. Local footy is really important, I think, you know, especially uh, Glen Marie being the suburb and this being uh, the main supplier of sports for the community. You look at what Glen Marie trying to do here, trying to bring up a women's team and, and in the background is my niece who just finished under 12. So at the moment she hasn't got a pathway. So Melanie's played for Glen Marie from the same age as me, from the age of seven. And she is now too old to play boys football. So she's excited about the girls team, aren't you? Very. So she's extremely competitive, not as good as me. Calm down. Probably a few kids are are not on the right road and I think if you give them that, that sport or that outlet to go and, and meet new people it can benefit the community in more ways than one. What do I say to girls? It doesn't matter who you are, what your skill level you are, what fitness level you are. It's a good environment to be in, it's fun, you meet new mates. This is where you want to be, so come down and have a kick.
So I'm Claire Johnston and I'm an accredited cricket bat maker and the first female in the world. I um, learnt how to make cricket bats from Ian Callan. There's a lot of bats out there for men and I felt that there was an opportunity there to actually work with women to make better bats and to actually make them for their style. So recently I was commissioned to make five cricket bats for the Pasco Vale Headfield uh, Cricket Club for their under 13s girls cricket team and uh, yeah, to see their faces when they were given the cricket bats was just brilliant. So what I'd really love to be able to do is to keep working with my local community, the local cricket clubs, uh, particularly the women, and uh, yeah, work to make great cricket bats. My name is Michael Tortoni. I'm the founder of Melbourne's legendary jazz club, Bennett's Lane. I've recently moved to the very, very cool Brunswick. The Jazz Lab here on Leslie Street, Brunswick is Melbourne's new home of jazz. In my old club, you might have seen Prince for a late night set, or the Winton Marsalis Band, or even the Harry Connick Jr. Trio. My new club will also host stars of contemporary music, starting with the Bill Frizzell Trio for the Melbourne International Jazz Festival, as well as local stars. So drop in for some great music and a drink at the Jazz Lab. So my name is Zainab Abouid, I'm 19 years old and I currently study the Bachelors of Law and International Relations at La Trobe University. I partake in my local community by volunteering with local MPs such as Peter Killil. I like to also attend and organise events that surround family violence to help ensure that women are heard and young women have voices. I wanted to represent myself as a Muslim woman and um, represent my community so I thought um, why not start at a young age so when I grow up perhaps I can become, be in Parliament one day. I feel like I should take advantage of these opportunities and make sure that I advocate on behalf of women, um, especially in my community that are subjected to family violence. My name's Leslie. I have been with Moreland Family Daycare as an educator for over 36 years, I think. Family Daycare is a wonderful organisation. We look after children in our own home, they blend in with the family, and it's fantastic. I love Family Daycare. I can choose my own hours, very flexible. I've made wonderful friendships with lots of the families. I'm now looking after children of the children I used to care for. The children just growing and developing is a wonderful, wonderful experience for me every day. I'd recommend family daycare to anybody and everybody. Oh, oh. oh, where's my scouty snuggle? Where's my scouty snuggle? Can I have a scouty snuggle? How's your tea party going? My name's Hilary, I've been with Moreland Family Daycare for eight months now and I absolutely love it. The main reason I started with Family Daycare was to be with my little one. Family Daycare is a small environment so mostly I only have four children and it's in a home. Moreland have been really supportive with the whole thing and they helped me find children when I first started. There's so many benefits of working Family Daycare and becoming an educator. Working in your own home, flexible hours, also just watching the other children grow and being such a part of their life. I recommend to educators that want a good life balance if they have their own child. Family Daycare is a great avenue to go down. Hey Moreland, today I'm down in St Kilda for the Midsummer Pride March supporting the LGBTQ community. It's a beautiful day, I'm proud to be here representing Moreland, walking behind so many wonderful dedicated people. This march goes towards exactly what our values are. At Moreland, we're one community proudly diverse. More Pride! More Pride! More Pride! More Pride! More Pride! More Pride! More pride.
having lots of fun. I like playgrounds too. Even ones with very big slides. I like the monkey bars and I like the knots and crosses. I like the monkey bars. I like the clocks. We are having lots of fun at this playground. Bye. Bye. I'm Haikal Raji from A1 Bakery. We've been in Brunswick since 1992. We specialise in Lebanese bread and pastries. We've also introduced a, a range of Lebanese dishes to our menu. And we've also got a wide range of Lebanese groceries. We like Brunswick because it's very multicultural. Me and my siblings have been here a majority of our lives. This is our second home and we like to treat our customers as our own family. We're very proud in what we do and how we do it. G'day guys, my name's Chris. Hi. I'm here from Moreland City Council just to show you a bit about this tractor and how it works and what we do and how we get around and cut all the grass on the ovals. Is that better? Oh, thanks. Thank you. 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 There was a serious lack of female competition and teams. Only 8% of participants using council sports grounds were female. To address this inequality, council introduced a policy to encourage clubs to be more inclusive of women, juniors, people with a disability and people from culturally diverse communities, or risk losing an allocation of a ground to a club that is being inclusive. Female participation has now increased by 161% in Moreland. West Coburg Football Club is proud to align with Moreland's policy. This year we successfully launched the club's first ever under 12 girls footy team. We're changing our club. We're changing our culture. I'm changing the game. Hello everyone. No, we don't know. It was an agenda. 
Is there a motion from the councillors? Yeah. Councillor Ryle? Thank you. I'm, um, I'd like to move the amended motion um, as. Sorry, I'm just trying to find it. Um, the alternative motion that we have around the VCAP position. Um, essentially, it's the same motion as Part A that went up uh, for the gen for the community and for people, which says that it was an addition to additional point 10, which says that the height of the building is reduced by an additional two storeys. And an additional point 11, which says the deletion of the rooftop decks or satisfactory conditions to address the hours of operation and noise impacts of the roof, rooftop bar. And we'll just wait for that word. Just get the word. Yeah. Can we just add to comply with David? Yeah, we can add. If that, just the one moment. Uh, you just need you to repeat that yes. second uh, alternative amendment. The deletion of the rooftop decks. Or satisfactory conditions to address the hours of operation. And noise impacts of the rooftop bar. Can I just ask a question? <coughs> just in the opening. Just a, sorry, just a moment, yeah. Council Cabinet. I'll just get the I'll just get the amendments up and then we can. Yeah, I'll just, just, show, just, just thank you. one question about. Them. And is there a seconder to Councillor? We're Ryan? going to do. Sorry, just to clarify um, to the chair. We're we doing Part A, Part B, Part C separately. Or if you're okay to do it all at once. Um, I'm more than happy to do it. That's once. okay. We'll do it all in one. Hit. I think we should do it in one. Is there a seconder to Councillor Riley's motion? Thank you, Councillor Dorney. Did you want to add something? Yeah, about can I just go through the other part? So I add part B and part C now, just to be clear, so everyone is aware of it. Sure, we're, okay. Yeah, thank you. And you're seconding, thank you, Councillor <laughs> Dorney. Um, under part B, after six, actually, I think it should read, is it six of March? That's my question. Is it the 6th of March or the 22nd of March? Right throughout the document, the it says the 6th. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll just clarify, yeah. we'll come back to clarify that. Whether, whether it's 6th of March or 22nd of March, we want to add after yeah. 2018, comma, subject to the changes outlined above. And part C, after the, um, at the end of that paragraph, um, maybe I should just read it. The Urban Planning Committee notes officers will participate in mediation to the VCAP compulsory conference on the 4th of April on the changes described in the without prejudice plans received 6th of March. We might want to change that to 22nd of March. Can we change that to the 22nd? Showing a height of eight storeys a street wall height of four storeys on Black Street and the corner of the Brunswick Road and Black Street and upper level setbacks of two and a half metres on Black Street. Full stop. Council's position at the compulsory conference will be will accord with part A of this resolution and the Urban Planning Committee will be informed of the outcomes of the compulsory conference. So thank you for bearing with me, um, members of the gallery. Yeah, just Councillor Rowe, I'll just get... Uh, yeah. So to clarify through, the, through the chair, okay. I'm just saying that the uh, part B has changed to the 22nd. So I think that Pass. is uh, that that is the set of plans that council is now concerning itself with. The only other suggestion, if we go to the two new items, if I'm understanding, the concern is the rooftop bar to the existing hotel, or the rooftop deck to the existing hotel, and I believe there are other rooftop spaces as part of the development. So. Um, Hotel suggesting rooftop. whether the deletion of the rooftop decks to the existing hotel building yes. might be okay. reflective of where councillors are. Well, then I think that's, yeah, yeah I'm more yeah. than happy to accept that that's suggestion, a clarification. Thank you. Um, I'll give uh, Councillor Riley the opportunity to speak to it if you'd like. As the Can I just yes. make a quick comment? Um, Councillor Tapanos mentioned something about at point 10 in keeping with the, the setbacks. Um, the height. I, I, um, yes, thank you, um, Councillor Boot. I was going to suggest to make it comply with DDO 18. However, I believe it may still have small inconsistencies in regards to setbacks, so it's probably best to leave it out. Thanks, Councillor Ryan. Uh, right, just I'll try and keep my.
comments succinct. It's, this is a complex application, um, and I, um, I, I think some of us are as frustrated. Some of the committee here tonight, if I, I don't want to speak on everyone's behalf, but I, I'm feeling that we're as frustrated as some of the community are around the processes when we were going when this has to happen between council officers and the proponents. A lot of discussions are going on, all to, towards a, a positive end. Um, and then last minute changes are coming through, which are uh, complicating things further. So I, I understand the levels of frustration. We are um, attempting to try and keep um, the application within the, the rules. The, the heights are flexible along this um, uh, corridor, but we uh, have been working as a council and all members of council are part of this urban planning committee now, um, although we have some apologies this evening. Uh, in trying to make sure that we keep as close to those um, heights as possible. And um, there's obviously, uh, well, I believe there's a strong feeling from myself and many others here this evening that two, we had four storeys and we feel that's way too high, but two storeys is still very high. And it's not what the planning indicates. And it's frustrating when applicants come and ask for extra storeys, which is really in many ways is a way of seeing, you know, it's extra margins for the development, not necessarily benefits to the community. Um, I, the other issues I have concerns with this application are the lack of communal space in the building. Um, we've already, I think the, the amendments are addressing the size of the, of the apartments. Um, and the fact that the street wall on Black Street is higher than it was in the original application is also a concern. Um, so, for all of those reasons, um, I'm wanting to move this motion this evening. And because of what we've said in the question time around the sensitive nature of this site, the history of the site, and the issues around the behaviours that go with um, alcohol and drug consumption in our streets, and we need to be doing something about that to make our amenity and, our, and life and livable and enjoyable in our, our city. And um, uh, we have some more work to do there. We won't be able to resolve all that in this application, but it is an important aspect of it, I think, that we um, address that and address the concerns of our neighbours and the people in that locality. So I'll leave it at that at this point. Thank you, Councillor Riley. Uh, Councillor Dorn, I'll give you an opportunity to speak as a seconder. Uh, yeah, I would just I concur with um, Councillor Riley's comments. I, I hope that um, although... Um, I, did, I just hope that this these amendments um, address some of the concerns of the community. Um, I have nothing further to add. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Dorn. Is there anyone that would like to speak against the motion that's been put forward? Any councillors that would like to speak in favour? I'll go to Councillor Kavanagh. Yeah. Uh, firstly, before I begin, can I acknowledge one of the objectors, Elizabeth Jackson, as a former mayor of Brunswick uh, in 125 years of uh, Brunswick City Council, only three females were mayor, including Elizabeth. So, uh, congratulations on that, and thanks for your contribution there, and which continues throughout your work in historical society, etc. Um, look, I find this. Uh, I am voting in favour of this because of the amendment that's been put before us. I do think the process is uh, well, actually stinks to be honest, and I think that uh, residents have got a right to feel uh, pretty peed off. In in all honesty, I think it's been a really poor process. And that's uh, very much in my. Uh, I put that at the floor of the applicant and of their uh, in, uh, and the people who are working for the applicant. I believe it's beyond the pale to expect that uh, a few days before the hearing that uh, plans are substituted and substantial changes, including an introduction of a uh, uh, a reintroduction of the rooftop bar, is unacceptable and should not uh, should not generally be allowed. But then we would go to the hearing on the 4th of April without a position. We need to have a position. We need to have a position that's strong. And I'm sure our officers will fight for that position as well as they can. But I do think that this has been a, a, a shoddy process and disappointing in the extreme. And particularly for a site that is so important to Moreland and the entrance to Moreland with an historic hotel. It should have, uh, you know, I would have liked to... Um, you know, a, a greater um, transparency uh, and and uh, a fairer process. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Kavanagh. Councillor Rabu. Uh, yep. So um, I will be supporting the amendments, and I really want to commend everybody's work on this because 
it's it is the gateway to the city. Um, we we disagree on this, but as far as I'm concerned, the other gateway at Ligon Street has been completely destroyed, and I can never ever understand how we go from parkland to ten stories. So we need to really keep that in mind because what we're doing with this development is we're potentially setting a precedent. We if we allow ten stories. Um, from this chamber to go on that corner, then we've got stuff happening in Park Street that's that wants you know twice as high as we expect. So we really need to um, keep a handle on the height of this development. But my real concern, because I was a Fitzroy girl who grew up in Carlton um, and spent quite a lot of time in many many historical hotels that are all still standing, um, albeit in different guises. Some of them are post offices, some of them are still pubs. But I think that um, the the implication on um, that old Sarah Sands Hotel um, and everything that happened in that space means that the heritage really needs to be protected. And I'm more than a little concerned that a rooftop bar on the top of a heritage building um, adds to the breaking down of the heritage of that building. Um, there's no way when it was the Sarah Sands anyone would have been on the roof unless they were doing something very untoward and trying to get arrested. Um, and so as, apart from the fact that I do completely understand that we will see development in that corridor and we do welcome good development um, and potentially it will end up to be something like the Provincial Hotel or, um, you know, maybe the Duke of Windsor or any of those other kind of edgy, trendy, cool hotels where civilised people get drunk and then vomit in the drains um, because civilised people still do vomit on the street um, from time to time. Um, what we put on top of it is a really big deal and the state that we leave the hotel itself in is a really big deal. And so I think that um, sadly this will probably have lawyers with deep pocket, well, people who are paying lawyers with deep pockets people with deep pockets paying lawyers um, at VCAT. But I think that if we don't do everything that we can to cap this a little bit, we're going to open the floodgates and just see more and more of these heritage buildings um, destroyed. And Councillor Bird, you just passed through. Thank minutes. you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Councillor Bolton, you'd like to say a few words? Um, I think this is a bit of a test case for Moreland because... Um, you know, we have seen a lot of our heritage destroyed in Moreland and, and various other parts of the city as well. And I think um, this is something where council needs to take a strong position of trying to retain um, this heritage building, this pub in Moreland. I also strongly feel that council needs to argue to lower the height limit to six storeys, um, as a lot of people who followed these um, debates of tried to um, argue quite a strong position that we should um, only approve um, or recommend approval um, a height, heights that um, comply with the height limit that was achieved as a result of the public discussion eight years or however, however many years it was. Um, I think that public consultation is totally fruitless if we um, don't then uh, consistently argue for um, a lower height. I think if you look in, in the CBD, some of the, um, you know, some of the buildings um, which are behind uh, the walls of historic buildings where just the wall, the facade, the skin of the building has been retained, um, the old Carlton United Brewery with the RMIT um, development, the massive high rise in, um, I think, Bouverie Street, um, and, you know, there's a number of um, examples, but I think, you know, it just really destroys that heritage fabric. Uh, in some cities around the world where the old parts of the cities have been totally destroyed, there is a, a feeling of loss of identity. Um, I think there are also the amenity issues. I am really upset and angry, along with Councillor Kavanagh and other councillors, about the fact that, you know, we were debating and working out a response on the basis of substitute plans and then suddenly on the eve of this meeting discovering there are other uh, second lot of substitute plans which make um, substantial changes to the proposal and the fact that residents weren't aware of um, the plan to reintroduce um, rooftop decks to this um, application. I think there are other amenity issues but I think um, I think we need to vote in favour of this um, resolution in particular to try and preserve the building and not just the skin of the building um, and uh, reduce the height by two storeys. 
Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Are there any other councillors wishing to speak? Councillor Bolton. Thank you, um, Councillor O'Farnley. I also rise to speak in favour of the alternative that's been proposed. Um, it is a difficult decision here tonight, um, but there is no doubt that um, this is a premier historical site in our city. It, it is a gateway to our city and we need to get it right. And, and it is quite disappointing that it is being rushed the way it is. And I think that if the applicant had worked with council um, in a more meaningful way, in a more honest way, in regards to what could have been achieved on the site, um, we would have got a better outcome. And I say that because I'm certain that when the owner purchased the site, they were fully aware of the Brunswick structure plan, um, design development overlay 18, and the height limits that we wanted to see in this site. So to get applications that are you know, 14 or 15 metres above that is just not acceptable. And you know, the community rightfully says, oh, so many stories is that an amber claim and applications like this um, really goes a long way to proving the community right in these regards. So um, we do have a design development overlay that talks about um, making sure that we have a mid-level sort of um, development here in regards to heights. Um, I think six stories achieves that or goes very close to achieving it. So um, that is what I will be supporting and that's what this uh, motion seeks to do. And I think that is quite important because as Councillor Bolton said, it was developed in consultation with the community and these heights really need to be adhered to. It's what we as a community and as a council have agreed many years ago and every developer who wants to develop in Moreland should know what that is and we need to send a strong message tonight that we are keeping with those within those height controls. Um, but even more than that, the most important and critical issue here, and the reason why I am supporting this, is because we want to preserve the Heritage Park. Um, it is the number one objective um, for me and for this council to make sure that we don't lose um, that Heritage Building, that we don't lose um, its significance as a pub that's operated for over 100 years and the whole building is retained, uh, not just the facade or, or, or what you see happening in some places around Melbourne. So um, when you factor in the, uh, uh, those objectives um, of maintaining the historical building and our view on heights, I think this resolution, despite its process that's been rushed, um, is probably acceptable uh, and we should, as a council, support it and hope to achieve an outcome at VCAT that um, meets those two objectives um, first and foremost. Other amenity issues which are equally as important I believe can be negotiated at the compulsory hearing and I, I do look forward to how some of those um, aspects are going to be treated and I think particularly around noise um, that is one that we need to make sure we get right because we need to make sure that we're not talking about the amenity for the residents that are there now, not just them but those new residents that are going to be right next to a rooftop um, bar, right next to a pub. So we need to keep um, their views in mind and look after their amenity interests as well. Thanks, Councillor Tavernos. Are there any other councillors who wish to speak to this motion? Uh, if there are no further speakers, we'll move to the vote. Uh, all those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried. Unanimously. Can that be recorded as unanimous, please? Can that please be recorded as unanimous? Thank you. Um, I will return the office to uh, outline the next steps. Thank you. So the Urban Planning Committee has resolved the alternate motion put up on the screen with the additional conditions 10 and 11 to Part A and the changes to Part B and Part C. The compulsory conference will take place on the 4th of April, which is next week. If consent is not reached at that compulsory conference, then a VCAT merits hearing will take place on the 14th of May. Thank you. Thank you, officer. Uh, the next report and final report we have this evening is DED 15 slash 18, uh, which pertains to the number of sites in Pentridge, along Pentridge Boulevard and Urquhart Street. I'll hand over to the officers to present the report when they are able to lay that in a couple of minutes. Thank you. 
members of the gallery. Final item relates to a request for an extension of time to an existing planning permit at a site at Pentridge Boulevard in Coburg. Um, the, uh, the subject site is highlighted in, in red up on your screen. Uh, there's an existing permit in place that was issued by the Minister for Planning in 2012. There was an extension, a previous extension of time granted for that planning permit by VCAT in May last year. At the same time, the permit was amended to delete um, part of the, the development um, from four lots, and those lots are to the south of that area shown in red on your screen. In terms of some other background, um, the applicant is seeking, seeking an extension to allow the development to commence by June 2020 to be completed by June 2024, so that's a two-year extension that's been requested. It's the second request for an extension of time. In terms of the amendment um, that was made to the planning permit and, and what um, has approval now, um, the um, elevation up on your screen shows um, the four buildings that now form part of the planning permit with the area um, in the red bubble having been previously been deleted from the development plans. So in relation to extension of time requests, there are a number of case law tests that um, are typically considered for these types of requests and the report before you tonight goes through each of, each of those tests and recommends um, that on the basis of those considerations that a further um, extension of time should be granted. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> are there any objectors or submitters who wish to speak? No. Uh, does the applicant or representative of the applicant wish to speak? No. Councillors, uh, do you have any questions to put to the officers? No. Given there are no questions, um, can I please have a motion for this item? Councillor Kavanagh? I'd like to move the officer recommendation on page 115. And it starts at 115, so I should have that earlier. Um, so it is only one, page 115. Yeah, and if I have a second, I'll speak to it. Uh, is there a second to Councillor Kavanagh's motion? Councillor Carly Hannon. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor Carly? Oh, yes, I will. Uh, look, this is an extension of time application. So therefore, there's, it's very uh, particular about on, on what grounds we can not grant an extension of time. That means that there's been a major change in planning policy, et cetera, since the original application has been made and a, name, a, run, a number of other possibilities. Uh, from what I can see, whether I like this application or not is irrelevant. As far as the uh, extension of time goes, then planning matters say that, in fact, there hasn't been a major change in planning policy as a, since the original um, um, granting of the permit and therefore I'm obligated to uh, uh, use my vote to vote in favour of the granting of extension. In saying that, I think from memory this is the second granting of extension of time, and therefore uh, I will say that you know our, our, our uh, patience is not endless. There will be, you know, um, you know, I'm hopeful that uh, at some point there will be a major change in the planning uh, um, uh, uh, structure around this site. And therefore, in future, we might be able to say, no, things have changed since the last uh, uh, permit uh, was, um, was, was awarded. But at this point in time, uh, really, uh, it's procedural, in, in fact, in, in, in almost every case. And so therefore, for only that reason, I'm in favour of granting the permit extension. Thank you, Councillor Kavanagh. Councillor Carl would you like to speak to the other? Are there any councillors who'd like to speak against the motion? Councillor Bolton? Um, yeah, I would like to speak against this. Um, I certainly understand the arguments that have been put forward by Councillor Kavanagh about, um, you know, um, being very particular about the basis on which you might reject an extension of time. Um, and I know that the council wasn't successful at VCAT when the applicant last um, approached council for an extension of the permit. 
Um, my feeling is that I don't want to see this uh, applicant just get constantly come to council to get permit extension after permit extension because my, my feeling from observing this development is that um, they've been doing a lot of selling of land but not much building on land um, uh, when they have had permits for um, development. So I feel that there are signs of the um, warehousing of land. Now I know that VCAT didn't see it that way in terms of the council's argument last year and did grant an extension. I feel that there should be more evidence of activity in order for, to justify them getting an extension. So I'll vote against this extension. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Could Councillor I, I'm just wanting to seek a question of clarification from officers actually, based on some of the arguments that have been put. Can, I, out, can yeah. I ask for that? Just, I'm just wondering, um, I mean, the arguments being put that there isn't, this isn't a case of warehousing, which is, means where, well, my understanding is that's where developers might sit on something and later on sell it once it's appreciated in value and so on, once they've got all the conditions on it. That's, we're saying that's not what's happening in this case. But I'm just asking, want to wonder if there's any cases where we have, a, where people actually do end up warehousing it and whether we have any comeback in the future if that turns out to be the case. Across the road. Wanted to go on the public record, I guess. Um, to, an to answer the question and, th and, and through the chair, the, in this particular case, there was, um, as the officer report sets out, a VCAT hearing last year where VCAT turned its mind to that and to the arguments that were put um, by the permit applicant in terms of on that question of whether there was warehousing and the steps that they were taking to um, progress with the permit that, that we're talking about tonight. Um, in terms of um, other cases from off the top of my head, I think the circumstances either um, play out whereby the permits expire um, um, or there are new applications um, which, which are ultimately assessed by council um, at a point in time. Um, I can't recall a case um, from the top of my head, I'm sure they exist, where there has been a successful um, um, VCAT um, argument in Moreland in relation to warehousing of the permit. I'm sure one exists, but um, within recent years, I can't, I can't recall one. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other councillors who wish to speak to this item? No, if not, then we'll go to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried. I'll go to the officers for the next step. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The yeah, planning committee has determined to grant the extension of time request. The applicant will now be notified in writing um, that the extension um, has been granted um, in accordance with the dates up on the screen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, given there is no urgent business, that concludes the business we have tonight. I'd like to thank everyone for their attendance and thank my fellow councillors for the opportunity to chair tonight's urban planning meeting. Councillors, members of the gallery and to viewers live streaming at home, I declare the urban planning meeting closed at 7.55. Thank you. Very well. Thank you. Thank you.